Hi everybody and welcome to the latest in our Friday Insights talk. This is one today is part of our first VJ Day 75 Never Forgotten series, which we at the National Army Museum are running in conjunction with our partners in the other service museums and the Commonwealth War Graves mission. If you want to find out more information about what else is in the rest of the program, there's some fantastic events with James Holland, Robert Lyman, and uh, Jasmine Khan is all speaking as well. You can follow the link here at the bottom, which should appear for you now, and you can click through and find out about how you can sign up to those, get far more information as well, and just see some of the fantastic stuff we've got lined up for you. Today, what we're going to do is kick things off by talking through some of the background to what the run-up to VJ Day, how the British Commonwealth found itself in that situation and the drive forward towards victory in 1945, by taking the story right back to the beginning of the war and the outbreak of war in the Far East. We're here in the museum stores, we've got some fantastic objects on display. My colleague Jasdeep is going to talk us through some of them as well. Uh, hopefully we're going to provide a real great insight into this, some of this wonderful material that we've got and uh, show you a little bit more about why the war in the Far East was so significant, even though sometimes it's, it, it's missing from more public consciousness about the history of the Second World War. So to begin with, Jazz and I, we're just gonna talk a little bit about the nature of the, the war in the Far East, where it sat, what was actually happening in the run-up to where things really began in 1941. So Jazz, obviously, you know, when it came to the Far East and the garrison of the, of, of the units of the Far East, now this was a mixture for the, for the British, so the British policy at this time was a mixture of, you know, regular British Army regiments, but also, also Indian Army regiments. And they were normally about a ratio of about sort of two to one Indian Army to, to, to British Army. Can you tell to start our viewers a little bit about, you know, the how was the Indian Army structured at this time? Sort of what was it what was its main role within India as well? What were its qualities? That sort of thing as well. I think the Indian Army as it goes into the Second World War takes in well, actually about a, over a hundred years of uh, uh, strong service, it's the best volunteer force that um, Britain has available at that time, proved itself um, very much in the First World War, uh, and then during the campaigns in the Northwest Frontier in the uh, 20s and 30s. As it comes into the Second World War, you've got actually quite low numbers, less than about 200,000 um, uh, troops. But the issue becomes um, the lessons, well hopefully the lessons learned from the First World War are the issues that we've got the Indian Army being sent out to regions by surprise, not really well equipped, um, not really well trained. Um, so actually in this instance, you've got more of a focus towards North Africa. We've got um, the, the Middle East and that sort of region as the priority. Um, and when we look at the Indian Army in terms of its composition at the time, you've got uh, you know, the, the, the famous regiments, you've got all of the, the frontier force and their experience of being in that region, uh, having engaged um, for, for, for decades. But then you've also got new regiments being formed during the Second World War. You've got regiments that, that pop up, um, like the Jamar Regiment, and, and, and localised, they, they only stand for a small period of time. But it's a, it's a, it's a real mix, um, because at this stage, it's not really known how many troops are needed. And so what we see as the war progresses is a, another real scrap at trying to get more troops on board. Um, and, and actually over the years you start to see uh, recruitment um, ramp up and you see people that come on board that actually may not have had that experience before. If we think about the numbers that they're trying to reach. First World War, we're looking at 1.3 million combatants. Second World War, towards the end of it, two and a half million soldiers. They had to come from somewhere. So it's a, it's a real interesting mix and we've got hardened, experienced troops uh, serving it, as well as new troops that actually haven't been in these uh, sort of fronts before. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because when we think about when the real events of this begin, you know, in Britain we're very used to talk about the Second World War as being a war that begins in 1939 and ends in 1945, but obviously in the Far East it's, it's very different. You know, things don't really come to a, to a head until the tail end of 1941. So in those years in between, you know, exactly as you mentioned, when you've got those really highly well-trained professional units of the, the, the Indian Army, actually they were even deployed elsewhere. Yeah. You know, because you think by, by the end of 1941, I mean, what's happened for, for, for Britain, you, you've had the retreat to Dunkirk, we've had the phony war, but you've had the retreat to Dunkirk, the abandonment of so much equipment there and the evacuation of, you know, more than 300,000 soldiers from the continent. The Norway fiasco has already taken mm -hmm. place as well. So the British Army has been found to be wanting in certain examples 
both in terms of its training, its doctrine, its equipment, and it's already going through a bit of a period of a rebuild. Um, but really, there's sort of defeats after defeats happening, and they're trying to plug the gap as much as they can. And much as they did in the First World War, they call on the Indian Army to, to, to do that and bring those guys, and they rush them away. But, you know, rushing those guys from the subcontinent to, to North Africa is, is one thing, but then it does leave you noticeably weakened elsewhere. And, you know, when, when we, I think when we talk to this more, we'll, we'll sort of constantly come back to that, that theme about sort of deliberate weakening yeah. uh, and, and the prioritization that's taken place uh, within this. You know, there's, the, the, I think it's fair to say all the commanders of the various places, you know, with, with, whether it's Hong Kong, which we're going to talk about, Malaya, Singapore, you know, they all had identified that there was a problem, um, but the, the remedies taken to, to correct that were, had, had, were not necessarily implemented. And I always think that's quite fascinating. But it, it isn't, I mean, uh, as the events go on and, 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 and as, as people tune in for the, the, the election and talks that come afterwards, you know, we'll talk about that transformation that takes place. And exactly as you said, you know, it's the, the makeup of the Indian Army units that we've got, particularly up to 1941, are they still sort of very much in that? That, that, that sense of, you know, uh, the, uh, the Punjabis make the best soldiers, the, the, you know, the, the, the Baloks, and, and, and these sorts of, these are the groups from which they should recruit. They haven't yet expanded too far out of that. Is that, is that right? By this period, yeah, pretty much the legacy from, uh, and lessons from the First World War stand. So, and we see this with uh, the Victoria Crosses Award, uh, awarded during uh, the Second World War. And if you start to plot the villages where they come from, again, from those three regions of Punjab, Nepal, Northwest Frontier, um, but at, at the same time, you've got new troops starting to be employed, but to do s certain other things. Um, and, that, and that's what really starts to change at this time. When you've got this real scrap and you've got this almost desperate call, and bear in mind, again, they're, they're a volunteer troop again, a desperate call for, for troops. Uh, you are going to get troops that haven't served before. You are going to get troops that haven't had the same level of experience before. Um, so, yeah, I think largely the same sort of composition. The focus is again in, on, on those regions, um, but when there's new actions and new sort of uh, skills required, you start to get these other regiments like the Mahars coming in. And uh, what it really starts to do is um, play with the stratification of, uh, of India. And so you've got these uh, people that are traditionally lower down the, the, the rungs of that ladder, but being employed for other sort of regions and other sort of roles. Um, what I find interesting when we start to explore this area is that, uh, well, I guess the question of, we talk about these, these massive defeats, we talk about these sort of, they're humiliating, they're, they're embarrassing, they're, you know, Churchill speaks about them uh, and, and almost gives, uh, well, he does give direction to say, well, uh, every officer and every commanding officer and his men need to give their lives to stand for, for these uh, regions that we speak about. Is it something, do, what do we learn from from our archives and from the stories? Is it something that could be prevented? Is it something inevitable? That's the big question in my mind about this, because many people have spoken about that. The way I kind of think about it is that if we're moving a resource from here to here, something's gonna give. Would you? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. It, it, you know, we talk about these things like the big disasters and the great disasters that happened. And I think there's a variety of reasons for that. One, I think, is because it's, I think it's a very British thing to proclaim these things as disasters. As, you know, Britain was seen as being a great power and it was seen as being defeated in, in quite a short space of time. Secondly, and, and I think this is a, a really key reason, it feeds into this huge underestimation of the Japanese enemy that's taken place. Yeah. You know, uh, Britain hasn't fought the, they haven't fought the Japanese in, in you know, the, the, all of their defensive doctrine organisations have basically been geared about fighting war in Europe again yeah. and, and preparing to fight there or small scale actions, you know, get internal garrison duty, campaigns on the northwest frontier, uh, these sorts of things. So these people, uh, these soldiers have not been exposed to this type of enemy, this way of fighting war. And when that is combined with a sense of arrogance and huge underestimation of yeah. Japanese capabilities, um, it really contributes and created a situation where actually a lot of this stuff was, was inevitable. You know, the, Britain wasn't equipped well enough, yep. the leadership wasn't in place, and there wasn't enough respect for the enemy. And then when the attack came, there was only so much standing that could actually be done before the inevitable happened and the fall of these bases and garrisons. There's also a weakness, I think, in policy here as well. You know, this idea that you can hold this territory, in particular throughout places like Hong Kong, uh, Malaya, Singapore, this territory could be held by, by the Navy alone. 
um, which you know, I won't create the naval power, yeah. but the idea of the you know, fleet to Singapore being the way you're gar- going to guarantee Southeast Asia. Very, di- very much different from America's policy of doing this. America sees Japan as a threat. America knows it, there's a vulnerability there. And it also doesn't want to engage right yet. Um, what's the perception of the Japanese soldiers um, from the British perspective at this time? When we say there's a lack of respect, what, what are the views? Well, it's highly negative. Um, the idea being that the Japanese are all right, they've delivered some, from a military perspective, um, of some very impressive success throughout China. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously, they've been able to conquer huge swathes of China uh, and but then subject it to quite horrific events that we know about. Um, but there's very much a sense, well, they've never been able to do that against Europeans, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, European-led troops or anything like that. And actually, once war begins in 1939, in particular, and war begins in real earnest in 1940 from a British perspective, the focus is exclusively on fighting that war in Europe, particularly as it's, a, it's not going particularly well. Um, and actually, Churchill and uh, Roosevelt, they agree that actually, uh, should war come with the Japanese, because there is an assumption that war will come, you know, that J- there has been Japanese encroachment right up to the borders of British, you know, British territory, particularly, particularly Hong Kong. But there's a, an assumption and, and between, and a really an acknowledgement between, between Churchill and Roosevelt that actually should Japanese, should the war begin, that what they're going to have to do is, is, is adopt a policy of containment, and they're going to deal with Europe first, yeah, yeah. and then turn their attentions to, to the Pacific uh, and the South and Southeast Asian region. It's quite interesting, actually, because once war does begin in earnest, it, it, it's debatable with the Americans are actually put more effort into the Pacific war than they are in Europe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But from a British perspective, at least, it, it's Europe, it's North Africa, it's the Mediterranean. You know, when you think about the big events that are happening in these places, no one is looking to, to what's happening. No one's looking to what the Japanese intentions might be, or taking them seriously enough, or really putting detailed planning in place. You know, you're, you're thinking of, if you think of things like, well, I mentioned Norway, Dunkirk, but it's Crete as well, mm-hmm. everything that's happened in, in, in North Africa. These are serious things that have occupied the mind and caused enormous anxiety and, and, and we have severe ramifications. So that's really building up to this sort of image. We talk about it being a forgotten war. We talk about being a forgotten part of uh, this narrative. But, but actually, that's from high command, isn't it? High command is saying Europe is focused, Europe is where we're going to uh, focus on, and therefore the public and media attention is all towards Europe. That plays really well in the Japanese, uh, you know, hands because for them a surprise attack is perfect because they might not know it, but actually the cards are laid really well for them. Um, when we start to think about the, the impression of the Japanese soldiers, Japanese troops from the British perspective, we get we get lectures and we get reports saying that they're not very good at night attacks. Uh, their mm, air power is mediocre. Um, their training is simple, they, they, they haven't really faced a European uh, uh, opponent, as you said. So these are the sort of things that they, they're thinking as they come into uh, uh, encounter the Japanese. What do we, what do we get from uh, the first, I guess, the first real um, engagement with the Japanese in, in Hong Kong? Is, uh, do some of those things still stand? Yeah, I think so. And what, what you also get through that as well is exactly as you just said, but on top of that, you get this assumption that the challenges of geography the British had always perceived and as being a, a, you know, the, the climate and the regions in which they were would provide a natural defense for them. Yeah. Those are seen to be quite, those, those are false promises. Uh, and actually the Japanese have you know, shown to move through that particularly quickly. When it comes to Hong Kong, you know, I mean, Hong Kong was always a very isolated position anyway. Um, there would have been huge debates about whether it could even stand in the face of any kind of assault once the, the area around it falls to the Japanese and whether it would just be a tokenistic effort. Um, it's not really particularly well garrisoned. Requests for additional troops have come in, are, are, have been either rejected or then, you know, something, there's two, two battalions of Canadians arrived, mm-hmm. uh, which is amazing. I mean, we're going to be thinking about distances. Two, two battalions of Canadians arrived. But, you know, for, for, again, if you compare what the Canadians are capable of doing uh, mm-hmm. later in the war in Europe yeah. versus yeah. what they're capable of doing in 1941, you know, yeah. the, these two regiments uh, are not particularly not particularly strong. Uh, only one of them has ever actually served outside Canada, but they served in, but they served in Jamaica. You know, they've not seen active duty. And of the, the 40,000 men that the, the British can call upon there, a mixture of, as I said, British, Canadians, in, there's two Indian battalions mm-hmm. there as well. The Hong Kong and Singapore volunteer artillery are there who've recruited quite extensively from amongst the, the Indian population in Hong Kong. You know, this is a, what you call a scratch force, and it's outnumbered about two to one anyway. They're not trained at the same level. They're not trained at the same level. They re- rely pretty much on sort of a static line of defense yeah. to try and hold any kind of aggression. It's sometimes referred to as the Maginot line of the Orient. 
is, uh, is, we all know what happened with the Maginot Line yeah. in Europe. Uh, but what, do you think the region is uh, a reason for the composition of uh, the troops there? Um, Hong Kong's not a priority. No. Hong Kong's a well, what we what we see from the the archives and the narratives is that it's kind of sacrificed. It's it's something that they could sacrifice. So you've got the Rajputs and the the Punjabis there. You've got the two Canadians that turn up. You've got the two um, uh, Italians and the British troops sits there. But then another two. So yeah, fourteen thousand. We've got nurses and it's quite. But it's real scratch. You're right. Yeah, and, and you've got guys like I mean, so these medals here, for example, uh, the, the, these belong to, to to Charles Walker. Uh, and Charles Walker was actually in the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Force. So these, you know, this is this is the the, the TA, the militia, however you want to call it. Um, and he ran an independent armoured uh, armoured car detachment. Um, and these are the guys who were thrust so violently into this this combat against battle hardened troops, about you know uh, an army that has been fighting its way through China and has battle experience, has been able to take those lessons on in a far more modern way of warfare than the British have by this stage. You know, when the Japanese launched their invasion, you know, they, they attacked the same day at Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Um, you know, the, and, and, and this is sort of a, a theme around it, that element of surprise and that direct like, level of attack in so many different theatres. It's fast, it's so it's fast. fast. Yeah. It's an amazing logistical effort, all of which begins to catch up with the British fire surprise. Uh, and, and you see that fall in Hong Kong. You know, the, 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 the hammer really starts to fall and come down in early on the 8th of December. By the 25th of December, the, the city has to surrender. Uh, it, it, That's the, quick. That's it's, it's rapid, it's quick, it, the, the defence is untenable. You still have, as I say, you still have these heroic acts that the, the defenders put up. You know, they, they don't meekly go into the night, you know, they do stand and fight. Uh, Walker himself wins the military medal for his actions on the 23rd of December. But, you know, these guys and, and these units, these, it's, it's, so much of this is bound up in, it's like backwater, if you say, uh, as you will. But exactly, you say, Hong Kong is, does not have the priority of the symbolism that Singapore has. It's not bound up in defensive doctrine in the same way. Um, what it how does, how does the garrison? Sorry, because so what it does have its own military tradition. You can actually see that both in the way they stand and fight, but also the cat badge here uh, mm. of the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Force, which um, you should be able to see coming up on your screen now in a larger image. But it's a beautiful uh, uh, cat badge again, very similar to what you'd expect from the British Army. But actually, you can see how they've really adopted the local iconography with the, with the twin dragons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they sort of very much bought into that that, that Chinese idea. Which is interesting because there was probably some in Hong Kong who preferred to hand the colony over to the Japanese and let the Chinese run it. Um, there's this very complex colonial society at play that yeah. means that you know if you are going to rely on, on, on Chinese soldiers or at least you know and, and this sort of thing to, to stand and fight beside you, you've got to give them respect. In the, in the early 1940s, I just don't think that's there. Yeah. I think get it by 1945, yeah. uh, and particularly come 1945 yeah. when the British and the Indian units fight alongside the Chinese in Burma, yeah. like Burma. Is there, but it, it, here it's not, and I think that does, does definitely counts against the British and their efforts to, to, to maintain a defence. But geographically, Hong Kong is a complex region because you've got refugees from the previous engagement in Japan and China, uh, you've got shortage of water, shortage of food, shortage of supplies, so it's going to be complex anyway. But these guys are put together as a defence force for Hong Kong, right? Um, well, I mean, when we're looking at his medals, we've got we know, you know, Pacific Star. Um, Defence and Britain, um, British War Medal, but this one, the Efficiency Medal, has your um, uh, Hong Kong suspension there. So he was, you know, he was there. What happened to uh, Sergeant Walker? So, so Sergeant Walker, uh, he wins his military medal on the 23rd, but like the rest of the garrison, he surrenders on the 25th, uh, and he goes into captivity, uh, and he basically spends the rest of the war in, his, in, in captivity. Now, unlike so many uh, 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 of the other prisoners of war who, you know, who we know is invoked so well in big popular memory about the, the Far East campaign. Walker actually survives uh, mm -hmm. and he comes back and, and his military medal was only actually awarded to him in 1946 after the war, yeah. so that's actually when he gets it yeah. um, and, and when, he, when he returns from captivity. So, you know, this whole British community is completely captured and transplanted out of this territory uh, and then for, for four years Hong Kong is occupied by the Japanese yeah. and, and, and is added to, to their empire. So we look at the, the you know, you mentioned that there was the surrender, the Christmas surrender. Um, so there was a there was a small sort of period of truce, wasn't there, on Christmas? And it was like a, a couple of hours to negotiate or, or to kind of agree the terms. It wasn't until the next morning that the, the official surrender happened. What was causing that to happen? What was it that, um, yes, of course, we know that uh, they weren't that well equipped and the, the troops weren't really in line, but what really was pushing uh, the army to retreat and surrender? What was the main factor, do we think? I think the, 
the idea was that it was they were constantly trying to fall back on a better defensive line. They were trying to constantly trying to hold hold a line that they could do. First, it was you know uh, uh, across the causeway, and then it was in different parts of the island. They started they started on the mainland. Yeah, they started on the mainland, and then they go back, and then they're basically driven back. Yeah, um, and it, it, each each position they hold becomes untenable. And part of this is because, again, going back to what we talked about being undermanned, you know, some of these defensive forts are designed to hold more than 100, 120 people, 140 people, 150 people, uh, and they've got, you know, platoons in. Yeah. So they're not making the most of the defense they have anyway, these fixed positions. Um, the, the Japanese maneuverability, the way they get around them, is, is essentially sort of constantly moving around all concentrations of force the British are able to put forward. Um, and that means that eventually they're driven back, they're driven back, they're driven back. And it just reaches a stage where it becomes, it's untenable, the position yeah. is untenable. Yeah. Continuing the fight becomes untenable. Um, they could stay, obviously, they could, they could have stood at foot for the last man, but the question becomes why? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, and, and, and that's it, there is no relief coming. So, so there, for me, I see this as a, a sort of a, a start of the tone. Uh, with Hong Kong being a sort of sacrificial uh, land there, they move back down to uh, Malaya, the, the peninsula of Malaya. If we have a look at Malaya, we, we see a uh, the same tone happening, but we see something different here. We learn a lot more about the Japanese in in this sort of uh, strip uh, down to Singapore than we do in in Hong Kong. Yeah, definitely. and that's what well, partly it's what well, we talk. You, you mentioned the surprise element. There's something else. These guys have a surprise up their sleeves, don't they? It's a. Uh, I mean, you know, the, how fast are they moving? They move down 50 miles in. Uh, you know, a short period of time, but their secret weapon is a bike, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the idea of bicycle infantry, I mean, it's amazing it's bicycle infantry through the jungle, and yet that ability, again, and this is what comes back to that, that sort of, that sense of lack of judgment and almost arrogance that comes with this, is that, well, you can't move through the jungle. I mean, no, no troops can move through the jungle, yeah. you can't do it. British troops can't do it, so nobody can. Um, well, and actually, you know, if, but even British officers have been exploring this, you know, they, they've, intelligence officers have been, been conducting uh, mock raids on Singapore base, uh, naval base, and mm. that sort of stuff to prove that actually this could be done. And you know, they knew that even during the monsoon season, you could land and do amphibious landing and get troops ashore. Um, I think what you see with Malaya, and I think the reason why Malaya has such an importance, and especially the run to Singapore over somewhere like Hong Kong, is that this was the real, this was a, a really important, this was key to so yeah. the whole yeah. defense of the region, this idea. Fleet to Singapore, this idea that should anything ever happen, you could get the, the British Navy fleet could get to Singapore in 70 days, and that would prevent any kind of further collapse. Now, throughout the 30s, that's been, been eroded quite heavily by either cuts to the Navy or reallocation or reprioritization of, mm -hmm. of assets. But this, by 1941, obviously, the, the war is being fought, the, you've got the Battle of the Atlantic going on, Battle of the Mediterranean, all of this has stripped out these things, and there's really very little that, uh, that's capable. Of being put forward, you do have Z Force, which is uh, the the you know the Britain, Prince of Wales and the Repulse, uh, the capital ships there. Um, the idea being that they could block any kind of amphibious landing on, on Malaya that, that, that could be launched to land Japanese troops, but they've got no air cover. Yeah, um, and actually, and it's a costly mistake, and it really shows the vulnerability of naval assets to. If you're sending it out without support, you 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 you're opening yourself up. For and the British only really discover when it happens, which is amazing because you know, you know yeah. they've had Crete and they had every, you know, and this this stuff has all has all taken place, um, and yet they lose those capital ships, and when they lose those, they actually lose the ability to have any kind of naval control and limit the Japanese. And suddenly the Japanese can fly in at a much quicker rate than the British or uh, and the Indians can. The Australians do come in and try and support yeah. them as well. But the same is the case for air force in this region too, right? So we're talking. Um, from from here on, we're talking it's a land forces battle. It's an army struggle. Well, is it most largely? It is, and it's in, but but it's interesting. It becomes that way because actually, again, and, and this is a a failure of policy before the war. You know, the idea that actually Singapore will be guaranteed by naval power, and then okay, well maybe we need some air power there as well. Mm -hmm. so, but we need the army. So what's the army there to do? Well, the army's there to guard the uh, air bases yep. and the airfields. Yep. Is that all they're there to do? Mm. And so yeah. this is a bit of a strange way of looking about how you would fight. And again, it's because well, you can't fight through the jungle and what's going to come. So the way in which you're going to dominate this is through through, through powers in, in the air and, and on the sea, of which Britain is supposedly one of the world leading powers. Now, the plan begins to fall down when you don't allocate correct resources to it. We talked about the Navy, but you've got the Air Force in there too. You know, they don't have frontline aircraft. 
you know, they, they don't have the best aircraft they've got. That's being used elsewhere. Right? Being so used elsewhere, well. exactly. It's the same story of the supplies, the equipment, the training. But what's, so, so if it then becomes a land force struggle, the region, if we look at the peninsula of Malaya, where you've got lots of rivers, lots and lots of rivers, jungles all over it. So jung, you know, the, 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 the region is very tough and terrain. What the British seem to be doing is, as they've got the north and they, they see a breach, they move back to another defensive line and move back to another defensive line. And that's the story we hear in uh, going forward as well. But as they do that, they're breaking bridges, aren't they? Yeah. They're quite literally breaking bridges. Absolutely. They're almost adopting sort of like a scorched earth policy behind them, anything to try and slow the Japanese down. Now, what is quite interesting, and again, you compare Malaya to Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, they had fixed defences. Yeah. In, in Malaya, yeah. They, in Malaya, people have been arguing for years about installing fixed defences, and, and, and the higher command leadership has said no. Recommendations were sent, and they were ignored. Huh? Yeah, exactly. They, well, they weren't even just ignored; they were actively rejected. Yeah. Yeah. This idea that you would build fixed defences and, and, and a line that you could hold, because actually, what you find in, in, in Malaya is, is you, you you will see pockets of strong resistance, effective resistance from the British troops there. You know, they're not on the run; they will stand and they will fight and they will hold up the Japanese, but they're outmaneuvered. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the Japanese use air power really well. They've got definitely superiority in air power, but they use light tanks really well. Obviously, their, their infantry is highly mobile. And the British haven't yet figured out that policy that comes much later. You know, when you look at Slim in Burma in 44, 45, mm -hmm. you know, you're box fighting, yeah. which is you will go out there and you will stand and you will, and you will form a basic tight defense perimeter and you will stand and you will you fight. Hold you hold it. And you bring people onto you and then yeah. you keep them well supplied and that's how you destroy your enemy. They don't, they just don't have that. But they, they, they also don't have tanks to, to counter these, but these are light tanks. The Japanese tanks are quite, and, and they think of tanks and tank warfare in a very different way. It's almost a support to infantry rather than its own entity. Um, but how are they crossing down the spine of Malaya right the way down to the foot towards uh, Singapore? It's, I mean, the way that I've kind of seen it is that as those bridges are being uh, destroyed and these obstacles are being created, they're just putting their bikes on their back and crossing, crossing those rivers and then back on your bike again. You can't compete a march against a bike. I mean, they're doing 14 kilometers a day uh, or plus. Yeah, and, and that's, that speed is, is, is it's extraordinary and it accounts for the British by surprise. I think also there's this real imperative on, the, on behalf of the Japanese because what Malaya is so rich in natural resources, you know, you know, all the resources that Japan needs for its war effort. Um, that it doesn't have, that it has to buy from overseas. It, this is where it can seize them. And Malaya has always been the big target for that. Uh, and so they throw in so many re resources. But, but even then, we talk about that. They're actually, Japanese are outnumbered by the British and the Finnish. But they don't know that. The British don't know this at this stage. No, and again, this is where we come back to this, sort of these other failings that are put in here. And this is a failure, this is a failure of just leadership in this case. Because, you know, the British have a plan to counter Japanese invasion, Operation Matador. They just delay, they just wait, mm -hmm. and they, you know, there's no... No one grips the situation and just plunges in because had they executed it, they could have done far more effectively. In fact, when they try and march into Thailand, they're actually fired upon by the Thai police and almost and, and yeah. really granted in a way. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no sort of understanding about how this can actually be done. Underneath that, you obviously have all the, 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 the long term Japanese efforts that go into plan this, the, the, the subterfuge, the espionage. You know, the, the, the Japanese have a very active intelligence yeah. network. Yeah. Um, all of which they've enlisted, and so they, they know what they're doing. So I'm glad you mentioned that, and I think that's the, the thing that we talk about in this narrative quite a lot, it's like the failings of the British, they were less equipped, and, and it wasn't a priority, and these sort of narratives. But actually, uh, under um, Lieutenant General uh, Yamashita, he's, he's really smart in the way that he's actually putting his troops forward. He has about 26,000 as he goes south, He's also flanking uh, lots of the Indian and the Australian troops, um, but at the same time, he does this really strange, uh, well, clever, of course, uh, sort of thing where he says, doesn't matter how much ammunition we have, keep firing so they think there's more of us than there actually are. And we learn later on that actually the numbers aren't the way that, that uh, the British think they are. And, you know, they, they did have the resources to be able to push forward. Um, what, what, do we, what do we learn about um, uh, Malaya, we learned, you know, it's such a, an important uh, access to Singapore. But as soon as um, the Japanese uh, breaching get into Malaya, the threat and all the priorities, like, well, we don't want to lose our, our, our big sort of uh, prize at the bottom, our big sort of focus. Um, 
So we've got VC, uh, we've yeah. got Metal Group here. I was hoping you could tell people a little bit more about this because obviously we, we've talked a lot about the disasters that have fallen this. And we've sort of, I think we have portrayed a relatively negative view of the, of the British and the Commonwealth armies which they've got here, which you know, is justified. But yet there are still examples of incredible heroism, which you know, here at the museum, we're really lucky that we can hold, that we can hold and we can continue to exhibit. So maybe you could just talk people through the, you know, this, this particular example. So the, the the metal group. I mean, I remember when we when we when we got it out of the stores. It's you know, it's impressive, if not heavy. You know, he certainly had uh, experience here. We've got uh, the the metal group relating to to Cummings. What right at the front, we've got the VC, and then that's related to this action in Malaya. And one of the things that we hear from uh, sort of citations and things for VCs, they're normally written in a very similar way, right? Um, uh, against fire, against all odds, they still proceed and they still go ahead. Um, but we look at Cummings' experience. So he's in the Frontier Force, 12th Frontier Force. He served with um, the Indian troops. Um, and they're well equipped. They were some of the best troops that the, the, the British had yeah, in the Indian Army. I mean, Cummings himself had won the, he won the MC in the First World War as well, hadn't he? So he was an experienced soldier. He's got, he's got the accolades. He's got everything that he needs to kind of put him in place. Uh, here, but also he, he, he gets this sort of um, kinship with the troops that he's serving, um, and and you, you see these stories with British officers commanding Indian troops uh, and other troops in the Commonwealth um, by Jackie Smythe and and his uh, his call for ten volunteers in the First World War, and they all more than ten part of the hand, and that come that shines through in in this example as well because. That relationship the officers had with their men allowed them to be an effective force. We learned in the First World War in about 1915, as the officers began to be wiped out, it's ineffective because the new officers didn't really have that relationship. What we've got here is uh, Cummings is um, uh, trying to gain uh, um, and, and hold this this um, this uh, section, but he's bayoneted twice. He's wounded. Um, and he's against the fire, he's, he's with a few troops, but actually almost single-handedly he's moving forward. Even though he's wounded, uh, he gets into a vehicle, he, he's been asked by his um, comrades, his soldiers, let's get you out of here. But he almost, he insists on being the last man uh, to go forward. So that's the, the, I mean, the story that we get from uh, VC winners, um, you know, it's always this against all odds, against even though they were shot, Nansen gets to be seen in a very similar way against Japan in Burma. He's bayoneted, but with his bayonet, he takes three different trenches. What we see from the First World War is we've got about 630 VCs in the first. Second World War is a massive drop, isn't it? And it's almost like that there, it's a different warfare. There's less of a focus on that. And, and, there's, um, and actually, what's also important about this one, especially because he's, he's commanding the Indian troops, he's the first of two. Indian, uh, of only two Indian only two, yeah. uh, officers to receive the Victoria Cross, does say something about the, the, the relationship and the efficiency of the Indian Army, um, whereas we've got a lot more of these stories in the First World War. Yeah, and, it, and it's, I think in many ways Cummings sort of represents the best of what the Indian Army can be in the, in the early stages of the Second World War, where you have these, these officers who spent long years alongside it, there's been sort of a, a cultural understanding, there's been long-term professionalism, you know, that's what these guys have, that's what they're doing. Um, and they are a really coherent fighting force. It's just, it's just not enough, is it? I mean, you've got there's there's, a, there's other brigades who are put in other battalions who are poorly equipped, not very well trained, just more experienced. And unfortunately, it's getting isolated and cut off. So for all the efforts of guys like uh, 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 of, of coming and his soldiers who, who, who stand and fight, the Japanese is constantly going around them. They're, they're, they're picking them up, they're surrounding them, they're isolating them, they're forcing this fighting withdrawal as they move down the peninsula. Um, constantly, um, and they're constantly gaining ground, and then obviously, as we know, that builds a psychological momentum as much as everything as anything else. You know, you can see that they've decided that they're going backwards, that they're surrendering this. Um, you know, they, they do put up a much bigger, a, a much stronger, stiffer fight in Malaya and, 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 the, and the country up there. You know, this is not a lightning campaign in the same way that, that Hong Kong was captured, um, but it's still a, one of sort of a, a, a continuous Japanese advance. So let's focus on the key focus of uh, this series of uh, uh, defeats and retreats. The most important area we see is uh, Singapore for the British. Um, it's where all of their resources are. They've got uh, a lot of money put into this uh, to protecting the fortress. Um, 
but also it's you know we, we see time and time again it being referred to as the, the Gibraltar of these. Why is Singapore so important? Why do we see the focus on Singapore? Um, and, and we've got the sacrifices being made uh, already before. But why, why Singapore? Singapore is just, it's, strategically, it's, it's, it's well sited, it's perfectly placed, it's a naturally defensible site in an island. Um, uh, it's geographical location, it helps maintain the sea lanes to Australia, obviously, so that colonial trade and, and, and empire is really important at the same time as well. And from there, it can be a basis from which to conduct operations into into the, the obviously the Indian Ocean as well as, as basically controlling and, and exerting British influence across the Southeast Asian region. I mean, you talked about obviously all that the, the military system. There's also the psychological importance of Singapore, I word, which I think is really important. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, it, this is from when we consider this is, you know, this is where the flag flies. Uh, you know, this was, was this was established as a, as a trading post, so where Britain established on the trade, um, where all of Britain's uh, imperial possessions in this stage uh, and colonies it has a strong British feel there's a big British investment uh, British community invested in there there are British institutions uh, they're in there you know the clubs the hotels all this sort of stuff and it's very much part of British prestige abroad uh, and that is about power and that's about symbolism uh, as much as anything else and so when it's threatened it, that that sends shockwaves that you know the, the psychological shockwaves that are almost as great as the military ones I think uh, and you know the, the Everything about defending Malaya has always been about Singapore. It's about finding Malaya is about forward defence. Yeah. That's what Operation Mandal was. Um, although, as we know, it's it's implemented. It's, there's too much hesitancy around it. It's modified. It's messed with. It's not simply just committed to, uh, and that's caused a, a, a huge problem. But as, as the advance has taken place, and as the, as the Japanese have moved down, um, you know, as soon as they're able in a position to cross the Straits of Johor, it's you know, Singapore is, is deeply, deeply threatened, and there's only so much they can do. It's a bit of a popular myth, this idea about you know, the, all the, the effect and attack from the sea, and so all the, 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 you know, the, the heavy artillery was facing in the wrong direction. You know, guns can move. Yeah. They could traverse yeah, yeah, them across. Yeah. Um, but, but that idea about how they would actually defend it, 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 it is valid. You know, this, this idea being that no one could come through the jungle, no one could land, um, and if they would, they'd be stopped. So therefore, you know, the, the majority of this uh, assault is likely to be amphibious uh, and a contested landing. That's that. What that influences actually, from a pure practical perspective, is the amount of ammunition, yeah, and the type of ammunition that these these big uh, coastal batteries have. Because they've got a lot, of, they've got a lot of sort of you know armor-piercing shells and that sort of stuff designed to tackle ships. What they have, what they lack, is, is things like high explosive rounds, which are going to be crucial for breaking up any kind of Japanese attack in their assembly areas, that sort of stuff, before they launch themselves across the mm. strait. Uh, and that's where the bridge begins to fall down. And you know. Uh, what you've got in Singapore really is a culmination of failure in leadership. You know, from, from political level, from civic leadership, military in particular. You know, Percival often carries the blame for a lot of what happens. I mean, he's just the person on the spot who has to surrender. Um, but a lot of the faults and the errors and the mistakes are made before he achieves command. You know, there's only so much he could do to correct them. He does make his own errors, don't get me wrong. Yeah, he does make yeah. mistakes. Um, but I think he, to a certain extent, he has been scapegoated slightly. But all of that, as, as we say, this, Singapore is, is, is where the Japanese are, are aiming for. That's where they're driving towards. And they're, they're never going to simply capture Malaya and not move And then not move more. Well, well, it's really, yeah, so that, that's really the aim of it. So we've got Lieutenant General Arthur Percival in, uh, in command here. He's against uh, Lieutenant General uh, Yamashita. And, and they've both got slightly different perspectives in the ways that they're going to do uh, uh, tackle um, this instance. Singapore is different because we talked about Hong Kong and we said, you know, we've got about 3,000 British troops, we've got about 2,000 Indians and some Canadians. Uh, Malaya, we have up to 50,000 that, that get captured there um, that we learn later on. But actually, Singapore, we've got over 80, 88,000 troops in Singapore. It's well guarded. Um, plus, what doesn't know how many troops Yam, uh, uh, Yamashita has and actually, he's only running with about 26,000. So it's really this game of, um, are they better equipped than us? They've certainly surprised us in the previous two. Um, but what, what are we going to do to kind of pr protect that? So you're right. So he takes this, this um, decision to protect, what is it, a 70-mile coastline and puts all of those resources to that. Um, and then when he does see that there is something coming from the, the Johor Strait, 
there, there's this sort of almost a dummy attack in the West, isn't there? Yeah, it's it, it's one of these strange things because once they're on Singapore Island, the, that is a naturally defensible position. They blow the causeway that leads them to the mainland, and that holds up the Japanese. The Japanese are going to have to get across open water. They're incredibly vulnerable when they do that. You're exactly right. You know, he, he, the, the defences are spread too thinly, trying to cover everything. Rather than concentrate uh, a, a, a sort of, you know, in, in, in a mobile reserve that you could then move into and fight and deploy, as when the enemy's intentions become clear, uh, he, he fundamentally misunderstands what they're doing. Even though they're subjected to this huge bombardment, you know, the heaviest bombardment they've had, you, you, you're looking at something like 200 rounds per tube that is being fired out by the, the Japanese at this stage. It's still, it should be a feint, uh, and it's either they won't come there, they'll come. There. There's too much assumption about what the Japanese will yeah. do. But you do, regardless of what's happened in, in the previous weeks, about which has shown that no one really understands what the Japanese will do until they do it, mm. this is, they cling to this belief that oh, they'll never come there, they'll only come here, um, and then the brigades that are, that are stood there become just way too fragmented, and gaps open up between them. And once the Japanese are in the shore, they're just able to exploit that and, and, and ruthlessly move through it, uh, and they force them back. As you say, he's well equipped with troops, he's well equipped with supplies. Uh, the, 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 you know, this is not a, a siege that's going to have a, a quick ending if they're, they're going to stand able to hold the Japanese off. Um, but it's, it's something the Japanese are able to force. It really is a great triumph of arms. On paper, if you look at it, if you look at the resources the British have in terms of the vehicles, the, um, even some air power there, you know, you've got numbers, everything is playing on the British hand. Well, they've got hurricanes. I mean, you put the airport there. They've got yeah. hurricanes in it by, by this stage. They are they're, they're always reinforced with taking place with more modern aircraft. So, is it? Um, we know one thing certainly that that set them off is the surprise attack and the sheer speed that the Japanese descended down to Singapore. So that definitely is going to take them uh, by surprise. I mean, just learning about Hong Kong um, literally hours after Pearl Harbor was you know through interception. And, and the garrison learned that they were at war with Japan. It was like that quick. But is it tactics? Is, is that the main thing that we're looking at here? Um, we also have an essence of, or, or a, a concept of uh, command, uh, poor sort of uh, messaging. When, when the Japanese do these sort of smart things where like, you know, he, he's sending extra ammunition out to make themselves look bigger. Look around us, we've got these paintings, we've got these troops that are wearing, um, uh, you know, the Grenadiers and the Bearskins and, and, and these great collections in uh, our art store here. It's to make the soldier look bigger than he is. Uh, and Yamashita did that. He did that, but but using the guns and using the troops that he had. So the, the thing that I'm interested in, uh, uh, in, in with, you know, with regards to Singapore, is that, you know, you've got the Japanese putting up these, these sort of dummy camps to think that, what, well, we're going to be here. They come in through the Johor Strait, they come through the east, but there's an issue with uh, the Australian troops and the command uh, or, the, or the, the, the messages that they receive. Um, so you've got the Australians kind of holding the line um, on, well, on the west, but there's one signal, one, one sort of message that gets uh, taken wrong. Um, and the Australians head back a little bit. What it does is it reveals the flanks for the Indian troops. And actually that just gave way to the Japanese, and, and it was like overnight, within probably eight, the ninth, like they went descended really, really fast. Yeah, and, and I think that that ability to exploit, uh, to, to maneuver and exploit, is something the Japanese had shown they were so good at, uh, and they really caught the British by surprise. They had shown that in the layer, and as soon as that that that, that gap opens up, um, then the, exactly as you say, you know, the, the Japanese are able to mobilise much quicker than they and able to, to 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 flood through it quicker than the, the, the British and the, the uh, Commonwealth Army is able to plug it, uh, and then it begin, becomes a bit of a dominant effect. I mean, you talk a little bit about the psychology. I think what's interesting as well is because, you know, we've talked about Singapore, we've talked about the impact, the psychological importance of Singapore, but, you know, some of the limitations around this defence of Singapore that we've talked about were known at the time, mm -hmm. and actually, I think as defeat begins to look more likely, those almost begin to loom larger again. It almost seems to become inevitable. It's like, Oh well, we actually can't do this anyway, so we couldn't do this. We yeah, couldn't do this, yeah. and that almost happens before the event. Um, and it's really quite astounding that that takes place. Um, and there's just this huge collapse in what the, the British will do because exactly as you say, you know, they've got they've got a huge number of troops. They're concentrated in a in an area that they can be supplied by road. It, it is well defended. It's got you know the, the naval guns and, and, and other fortifications that are built around it. So 
theoretically, they, they, you know, they, they could stand, but then the, the Japanese were just able to exploit every advantage that they get, uh, and it builds momentum all of its own. And then obviously, you know, come February, the position is, is untenable. What we what we start to get the way in terms of the way that um, Singapore is protected. I mean, certainly the coast in the south is starting to be the, the focus to begin with. Then you've got one region, and when when the Japanese make their inroads, um, Purcell was trying to send any sort of troops that he can, a division of the Indians to support the Australians there, and then it falls, and then they decide to fall back again. For me, the the crux of it you mentioned is siege, the concept of siege before this is. Uh, you know, we're talking an island, you know, there's nowhere else to go. The concept of seeds can only be long-standing if you've got resources. So for me, the crux of it is the reservoirs in the middle. What's going on there, because what happens is you've got the Australians and the Indians really being focused on those reservoirs. If we lose those, and that, that's um, a source of fresh water, the only source of fresh water that they have. We lose those, we're already short of supplies of food and ammo, then we lose everything. And, and actually, Purcell sends a lot of his troops to guard the reservoirs, but um, before long, they, they start to lose that too. What, you know, is that, that's really surely the impact, the biggest sort of blow um, for Singapore. Once you start to lose that, there's only so much you can do, right? Yeah, I think so. And, and, and that's when you begin to see all this, this process of, of scorched earth. You know, some of the, there's quite famous photographs, for example, the oil tanks being lit on fire and that sort mm -hmm. of trying to destroy some of the weapons and, 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 and units burying their weapons or destroying their weapons. And, and, and it all comes to a head on the, on the surrender on the, the 15th of February where it, some of the things they, they cannot resist anymore. And the, the question becomes, much like in other places, the question becomes, why would you do that? You know, uh, and on the 15th of February, the, 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 the hate surrender. And actually, I mean, what we've got here, what we've been talking to you from mm. uh, is actually this. So this is a flag. Uh, taken from a government building in Singapore, it, it was as you can you can see the the, the, the characters on it, um, and we know it's taken in Singapore because actually what these characters translate as as being it says you know Singapore Memorial Victory Memorial, 15 February, uh, and it also is taken by we know who took it Sergeant Ushimaya uh, of the Japanese Sergeant Ushimaya of the, of, the, of the Japanese Army, and it's amazing, isn't it? But what is crucial about this story and what we're going to unpack a little bit more over the coming weeks and some of the other events. Uh, is that actually this flag is then recaptured by the British in Burma and rediscovered. And that's absolutely amazing story. And that talks about the change of fortunes uh, that take place, you know, from the, from the lowest of lowest of ebbs here uh, in Singapore to, to then what probably reaches a, 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 really almost a high point, in triumph, one of the greatest triumphs, I think, of British and Commonwealth arms yeah. ever, really, yeah, so. is that campaign in Burma. And that brings it through this round. It almost wouldn't have been, I mean, we learned that it's a 15th of February here, it almost wouldn't have been that date because Yamashita gives him two, gives Percival two or three different instances to say, surrender now, and you know, no further lives need to be lost. Percival doesn't heed that, he doesn't go ahead with that. Of course, he's got Churchill and others kind of saying, no, there's no point, there's no uh, even option of retreat. So actually, a lot of troops are lost there. Um, but then, you know, we talk about the reservoirs. When they lose the reservoirs, he, he changes tactics again and brings everyone outside the fortress. And so it's really about protecting the south, the fortress in the south, and that's really the crux of it. What then leads to the surrender seems very much to me like, uh, well, it's, as I said, um, Hong Kong set the tone. It's the same narrative. It's when uh, resources are depleted, ammunition is low, uh, food, supplies, water is low. Um, so Percival has to make this really difficult call, doesn't he? And he does that on the 15th, where he finally uh, calls command, and there's a conference with command, and then uh, they agree to retreat. And th I think this flag is a really interesting, uh, uh, an, an evocative object for that, uh, for that narrative and for that day, because there's that famous video of Percival walking uh, with the flag for surrender. And again, you know, he's got the he's got the white surrender truce flag, and he's he's got the Union flag behind him, and and actually to see these Japanese characters on this flag is really that symbol of uh, victory for them and defeat for the British in this instance. We know that we have uh, lots of Japanese flags in our collection um, with with writing on that, and I think that's what makes this uh, so evocative and, and such a symbol. Of, of of that that humiliating defeat, which we learn later on. Yeah, on. and it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's almost like Singapore, Singapore becomes important in the British psyche because it's been lost. You know, before February 1942, 
you know, it, you ask people, it, you know, people in Britain at the time about, about Singapore, about, you know, what's the key to the Far East and the British, no one's going no to say, that. people don't know, no. people don't know. And yet the defeat um, is, is, is presented as being such a defeat that it, it, it really creates, it, it's a self-perpetuating beast yeah. in, in, in a way of, of, about this. Um, but at the same time, what, on the flip side, what you can see from, from the Japanese perspective, you know, we talked about you know Singapore and, and Malaya and, and these never getting the the, 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 the cut of the best resources, always being you know third in the third in the priority of two mm -hmm. type thing yeah. situation from a British perspective. The Japanese, this is exactly where they're going, uh, and this is exactly what they're tasked with doing. And they're going to get there. So that changing, I think, uh, in, 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 in motivation, I think, is in that difference in motivation is really key mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that you know, obviously, that, that, that it, it is recognised, and that, that, that to put in it is 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 remarkable, and, and you see that tenacity that the, the Japanese then apply elsewhere. You know, you think about uh, Burma. So you know, this this is not the end of the the, the, the period of defeat for the British in 1942. You know, the, the, within the following month, they're being driven out uh, of Burma and, uh, and Rangoon, and they're beginning a thousand mile retreat basically mm. on foot back yeah. into India. You know, that is like walking from Birmingham to Rome. Yeah, yeah. Which is huge. Yeah, you know, yeah. it, it, they are quite, you know, and, and Slim always talked about it, you know, Slim said, you know, I've been kicked where it hurts uh, by, yeah. by the Japanese yeah. way out of Burma, but, you know, come 1944, he's ready to go back. But the aftermath that we learn from uh, these three engagements is tragic, isn't it? We've got the Alexander Hospital where 300 um, uh, uh, well, patients, or over 300 patients, are are, are murdered, are, are, are you know bayoneted uh, in their in their beds. We learn about the prisoners of war. So, Percival, you talk about the you know the the retreat and then then recapture in Burma. But Percival was captured himself. Yeah. Um, he you know his fate was quite interesting because he was a prisoner of war for for those periods uh, for those several years. But actually, uh, the tables turned because he ends up being there for Japan surrender itself. He's on, he's on board the Missouri, yeah. And and Yamashita sees a very different uh, end after the war, um, being you know facing uh, um, uh, those issues about war crimes. So one of the things that we learn from 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 uh, these different uh, actions, you know, one of the big things that 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 strikes me is that the Japanese struck fast. Uh, very, very tactical, um, but more than anything, I don't think the British Army will, um, and, and the lesson that comes out for me glaring is that the British Army will never uh, underestimate an, an enemy again. Here it's, you know, they can't fight a knife, they don't have this, they don't have this, it'll be all right, this region will be okay, and then suddenly um, they, they, they really capitalize on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I 100% agree, and the psychological impact that the, the, the Japanese victories have over the, the, the British, um, it, it, that takes years to overcome, years, but then also, and this is what Slim is so good at, and Slim's actually appointed to command a 14th army, yeah. it's that rigorous training that you put, because that's how you overcome that, that fear. You, yeah. know, you, you, you build people up and you build their skills, and you create confidence in people's skills and their unit and the guys around them uh, and the overall concept of what, the, of what they're capable of, and that's how you overcome fear, and that's how they begin to erode against the Japanese. Yes, there's the role of guys like the Chindits and, and, and those sorts mm -hmm. of things. And then obviously Imphal and Kahima play a massive part because the British are seen to actually stand and fight yeah. uh, in a way that they hadn't, again, to, when they hadn't been able to withstand other big Japanese assaults before. And that all begins to have a massive impact too. But again, we shouldn't, I don't, when we talk about Singapore and the impact that had, Singapore becomes vitally important for the British reconquest of this region. Yeah. We talk about Burma in 1945 as being the triumph of, of, of British arms. And that's in a way because the war ends in 1945. Where actually, with what the British are planning to do for 1945 and 1946 is recapture Malaya and Singapore. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be their next big operations. That's what they're looking for. And in fact, 14 armies withdrawn from Burma so it can prepare for that before the war actually ends with the drop of the atomic bombs. Uh, and this is the thing that they we talk about them being largely forgotten. We talk about this this front as being largely forgotten. But the war's still going on. Uh, you know, uh, Europe's Europe's done with this, and they're they're still carrying on, and they're still trying to um, uh, trying to bring those back. So we've got some really interesting, uh, and, and we're quite fortunate actually in in the the collections of National Army Museum stores that we can showcase these stories with these objects and have real windows through uh, um, through time to tell us about these instances. We learn about um, 
you know, underestimating the enemy. We learn about surprise fast attacks. We learn about poor planning, and we learn about um, uh, really just being overwhelmed by an enemy that, that um, I guess, the British Army were, just hadn't studied in enough detail. So as as we close this session, we know that um, we're doing a, a variety of different sessions to unpack the other layers of um, the the war um, in. Uh, with Japan in the Far East. So there's a variety of different things that we're doing on um, as part of BJ Day on. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a whole program of events planned, as mentioned at, at, at the top of the hour. Uh, and actually, if you again follow the link in the call to action bar along the bottom, you'll be able to see that full program. You'll be able to sign up to them. You'll be able to register for those events too. Huge swathe of different type of things, different different things that you can sink your teeth into and, and, and explore along with us as we as we you know we we celebrate and commemorate what happened in the war in the Far East and, and make sure, you know, the, the, maybe the, the forgotten army and the forgotten events are, are never forgotten and we can continue to talk about them in the present day, you know. We in the museum love doing that. We love sharing these stories and sharing them with you. And, and we're really pleased that you could join us uh, today to, to talk about the, the sort of the, the negative uh, and the difficulty over the years that the British and their Commonwealth faced uh, in this region. But over the coming uh, sessions, the coming lectures, you'll hear from some fantastic speakers about how some of those, uh, that how defeat was turned into victory uh, and how the British uh, eventually turned the tide.